Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you've had a good day so far. Uh, my name's Anne-Marie Powney. Um, I've been working for Aquarius since 1996, so almost 20 years now. Uh, Aquarius is a charity. Uh, it was established in 1977, um, initially as part of a research project at Birmingham University. And we support people, um, individuals and family members. Um, Sorry, can I do that? Oh, no, that's fine. Sure. Yeah. Um, with alcohol, drugs and, and gambling. Um, I've had various roles over the years, um, and my most recent is working alongside one of the UK's largest car manufacturing companies, um, providing support across their six UK <coughs> sites. So what we're going to cover today, um, a brief snapshot really, Aquarius's current role, a brief look at commonly used substances in the workplace, um, we'll look at a case study that I've dealt with, um, and the benefits of the service um, at the moment, and then any questions, hopefully, at the end. So Aquarius's current role and why we're there. Um, well, research is currently showing that there's a huge alcohol and drug issue across the whole of the UK workforce. Most recent figures indicating 7.3 billion loss to UK businesses due to alcohol-related sickness and loss of productivity, and 1.4 billion loss in, in terms of drugs. Um, I've been employed to provide in-house support, so one-to-one -one work, training and alcohol drug awareness at wellbeing events such as these. My overall target is to prevent and reduce absences caused by alcohol and drug use. And the main benefit for this is there's actual evidence for the company that people are actually meaningfully engaging in sessions. So I'm sure in lots of organisations where this issue has come up, people have said, yes, I'm going for support, I'm going to external agencies, and actually there's no evidence that that is taking place. Um, the other benefit is that it's actually easier and far more comfortable for employees to engage in sessions who actually may avoid external services, which is very common. Um, I'm not there to replace the alcohol and drug policy or protect employees from testing. So my role is very supportive, but I can't protect employees from that policy. Um, and in April 2015, um, the yearly contract was extended. So they were really pleased with the results and the outcomes. So it began, they actually did their own research in terms of getting some support in, in-house. Uh, the evidence is that in 2011, 8,748 alcohol-related deaths and 1,784 related to illicit, illicit drug use. Um, both cause a significant harm in terms of medical, psychological and social harm. Um, and as we know, these harms impact on healthcare, crime, family and social networks and the workplace, which I think has really been ignored for many, many years and just brushed under the carpet, to be honest. Um, approximately 65% of the UK working population is of working age and workplaces provide opportunities for health education to identify individuals who have problems with alcohol and drug use. So what did the company do? Well, they recognised and were very open that a number of employees will have alcohol and drug issues. They present significant health and safety risks to themselves and others, but they also need help and support to overcome their problems, remain in employment and preserve their health and wellbeing. And at that time, there was no formal process in place um, and there was no current in-house resource that, that, that lacked expertise. So the response was they introduced and reviewed and relaunched a new drugs and alcohol policy in 2013. And there's two strands to this, the disciplinary side to protect the business and co-workers, but also the support side for those who have a problem and are actually willing to engage in the service that I provide. Uh, so there's two routes of referral at the moment. Um, one is management HR, where employees have been open about their issue um, or may have been tested. Um, and then there's a the self-referral side if they go to occupational health, speak to one of the occupational health nurses and actually disclose that they're having problems. They can self-refer into me, purely confidential, very discreet, and come for one-to-one -one sessions. And actually at that stage, management and HR don't know that they're coming to see me. Um, consulted with Aquarius, and then in April 2014, I started my role in-house as substance misuse practitioner. So what are employees using? Well, the three main substances that are currently reported to me are alcohol, which is a depressant, cannabis, also a depressant, and cocaine, which is a stimulant. Um, legal highs are on the, on the up, 
as we all know, but only one person has ever reported about legal highs to me at the moment. So this is what to look for in terms of employees. I've tried to condense this because you could have a whole day on alcohol and drugs. I'm talking about it. Um, so gen generic effects, accidents and mistakes at work, tiredness, disturbed sleep. So these run across all of these substances. Lack of concentration, memory loss, so people will find it difficult training, learning new skills. Changes in mood and character, so if somebody's behaving differently and not, you know, they're not their usual self. Depression is an absolute certainty that is behind all of those substances. Anxiety, poor timekeeping, and then regular absences, either after weekend binges or more long-term, so people might be signed off, possibly for alternative or unrelated reasons, stress, depression, um, because they don't want, actually, on their sick note to have that it's an alcohol or drug issue. So, you know, sometimes you have to look behind what somebody has signed off for. So, in terms of specific effects with alcohol, there's obviously the, the smell that we, we, we know. That's often disguised by mints, chewing gum, strong aftershave, perfume, slurred speech, and people possibly start are a bit unkempt, they're not looking after themselves as they normally would. Cannabis, cannabis a, a classic sign is bloodshot eyes, increased appetite, the munchies. And cocaine, um, dilated pupils, people become, because it's a stimulant, people become very excited, they're very talkative, they might be overconfident, and regular sniffing, so almost like flu-like symptoms, like they've got a runny nose and sniffing constantly, rubbing their nose and sniffing. Um, so those are things that you can kind of look out for. So, zero tolerance versus the legal limit. Um, with this, it's, it, it's really what's the, what right policy is right for you. So in terms of the job roles within the business, driving safety critical roles. I mean, I'm clearly not an expert on quarrying, but I guess a lot of them are safety critical ro roles. But if a legal limit is imposed, restrictions can be imposed either by HR or occupational health, depending on a person's situation. Um, clearly, we need to look at the health and safety of not just employees, but contractors, customers and, and stakeholders. Again, I've mentioned about being the right poly policy for you and looking at the pros and cons of, of that policy and being realistic. I was actually quite surprised when I started in my role. I automatically assumed that it would be a zero tolerance but they've actually got the legal limit in place. Um, and then when I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, we're all allowed to get behind a one-and-a-half-ton car and drive down the motorway and around our roads at the legal limit. And I guess they were being realistic about possibly if they had a zero tolerance, you know, how many people would, would be sacked. And I, I think that's probably the case for many, many organi organisations across the, across the country, to be honest. So, random testing versus for cause. So, again, consideration needs to, to be take place in terms of the type of testing that you're going to use. Is it going to be breath and or saliva tests, urine, hair, and how invasive are these tests in terms of thinking about human dignity? Who's going to take, these te take out the tests? Is it going to be internal trained staff or an external provider? I personally think an external provider is the best course of action because they are impartial. Um, at the moment, we use Synergy. Um, they have a two-hour target time to come out when they're called. And everybody that is either breath-tested using a calibrated uh, breath-testing machine and a, a swab test for drugs. So that's automatic. And then also thinking about the action that you're going to take. Is it going to be suspension? Is it going to be instant dismissal? Are the police going to get involved if it's illegal substances? So there's many things really to think about. Um, so for cause, which is what we use, that's post-incident, near miss, reasonable suspicion in terms of behaviour, so any accident. Um, I guess the downside of that is the potential for malicious accusations. Um, but testing for cause is working for them very well. Um, and as I say, they use synergy and call in an impartial external company. If somebody's proved positive, they are automatically suspended, but not instantly dismissed. And then random testing, I guess, 
employees may be less likely to take risks if they know that random testing is going to take place. Um, but also there's consequences for the employees and the, and the company. So if it's zero tolerance and random testing, um, that could be very difficult to deal with. I did a presentation a few months ago. A guy said his, it was zero tolerance, they random testing. They were due to random test one guy and they decided that they'd test the whole team and six people tested positive for drugs. So they, he had to dismiss everybody there and then on the spot. And he said it was the worst day of his working career. So there's lots of things to consider um, in terms of a, a, a drug and alcohol policy. I mean, it may well be, I, I was with the fire service on Monday, that in companies you're going to have safety critical roles where you might need a zero tolerance. But then other roles, which are more administrative, that could be the legal limit and have, you know, a, a policy depending on what role somebody is in. So there were a few barriers to people engaging with the service initially. Um, and I guess that was about negative association with going to see somebody about uh, an alcohol or drug problem. Um, employees had fear of disciplinary action and dismissal. Um, and there's a lot of shame and embarrassment that goes alongside anyone with an alcohol or drug problem and the, and the stigma and suspicion that what are the company up to? Why are they suddenly providing support for alcohol and drugs? So that was something that I really had to, to work with and try and um, break those barriers down. Um, but we did overcome the barriers um, and that was by training close liaison with occupational health staff, um, training and appropriate communication with management and, and HR, um, a positive and proactive promotion of the service. So there's lots of posters. We put posters in uh, discrete places like the loos with little cards that people can take with various national numbers on, but also the occupational health number so that they can phone if they want, and just self-refer in into occupational health and come and see me. And then confidentiality and discretion is absolutely key. So a lot of the time people come into occupational health, but people don't know that they're coming to see me. They could be coming to see one of the doctors, they could be coming to see one of the physios, one of the nurses, um, one of the CBT therapists. So it's very discreet. Um, and word of mouth has really worked well. Um, so one guy who was really reluctant to come and see me... Um, got hold of his mobile number, phoned up, did some engagement work over the phone with him, and he says, actually, I will come and see you because one of my mates has been to see you, and he said, it's all right. So, actually, word of mouth, you know, it filters through. So, just to give you a case study um, with a guy I work with, a 58-year-old male, um, he was originally a self-referral, but it eventually ended up being a management HR referral. And I think management knew all along, if I'm honest, what his problem was. So his goal was initially to control and have social, oops, sorry, social drinking. But I, I knew from assessment that abstinence was required, that he'd never be able to socially drink. Um, he ended up in hospital, had an unplanned detoxification. Um, his consumption and pattern assessment was daily drinking, um, four cans of 5% lar lager and some brandy. Um, I, I believe he was minimising his consumption, as many people do, because they're embarrassed. He had a long-standing history of problematic daily drinking and related absences. So he drank for years and years. Um, his issues were depression, loneliness. He'd had a relationship breaker. Um, so he was very depressed. Um, he presented extremely ambivalence around abstinence. So, well, I don't really want to give up drinking, as many, as many people don't. And Aquarius is an anti-drink, so we work with controlled drinking and abstinence. Um, he, there was a real fear of abstinence. He couldn't visualise a life without alcohol because he'd always had a drink. Um, I provided 23 one-to-one -one clinic visits over 13 months, from May to June 2015. Um, he's been abstinent now for over 12 months, and uh, he's still dry because I keep checking before I use this as a case study. Um, and he's... He's just a different person. Um, so a lot of my work was motivation around trying to encourage him to abstain and relapse prevention work once he was abstaining. Um, he was very reluctant to engage with external services because he was embarrassed and he felt ashamed. 
Um, his con consumption and pattern of discharge was abstinence. And he reported key improvements. He'd got a clear mind, a clear head. The positives of not drinking outweighed all the negatives that had been in his life when he was drinking on a daily dependent basis. One of the tools we use is something called the Wellbeing Outcome Matrix. So this is a, a scoring system where people measure um, where they are at assessment when we initially engage them and then where they are when we discharge them. So one being very poor, it can't get any worse, ten being excellent. He scored himself three in all key areas. So we look at alcohol, physical health, emotional health and work. And then as you can see at discharge, he was a ten for alcohol, eight physical health, nine for emotional health and nine for work. So it's a really good visual aid that, that we provide people with and that I, I actually complete in sessions. And it's quite surprising, really. I've, I've been quite shocked because I haven't thought that guys would, because predominantly I'm, I'm working with men, would want to take worksheets home with them, handouts. And they say, can I take, can I have a copy of that and take it home? Because it, it's absolute, you know, a demonstration of how well they've done. And then just some other positive benefits that have been reported at discharge. So work, relationship with partner, health and mood improved, fitness, appetite, happiness, positive life without alcohol, I feel like a different person, mood improved, sleep improved, alcohol is just a short-term fix, more motivated, more energy, able to focus on positives, appreciate life contentment, an ongoing case, not had a day off work since attending appointments for cocaine use. I saw a guy yesterday who said... I know for a fact if I wasn't coming for these appointments, I wouldn't be in work now. So, um, and I'm a happier, healthier person. Um, so final conclusions, I, I genuinely believe that this service is helping to prevent substance misuse, induced short and longer term absences. Um, and I think one of the main things for me is we're reaching people who would never have considered engaging with external services, that would never have gone and sought support or help. Uh, because it's there for them. They can go in work's time. It's confidential, it's discreet. Um, we did a 360 feedback report um, after a year in post, and um, it was good, so 100% of the staff um, agreed that the service should continue, and the employees that we surveyed, either 70% strongly agreed and 30% agreed the service should continue. So, you know, we're really getting some positive <coughs> and um, successful outcomes from the service. So, thank you. And any questions? What's the legality of surrounding <coughs> the legal? Well, it What's the legality, obviously. If you're the legal limit, you mean? Yes. <coughs> well, in a business, a private business, we've, we've all got policies to drink and alcohol, but you do yeah. resistance if you sort of start. Well, if, if they have the legal limit, which is 35 micrograms in breath or 80 milligrams in blood, then it's, it's, it matches the legal limit for on the road, which, I, to be honest, I don't know any other companies that would have set their own limit of, say, 20 micrograms or 15 micrograms. I think, yeah, zero tolerance for, for, for some companies, but I think you'd be surprised about the amount of companies that actually have the legal limit as their... Well, that, that depends on the alcohol and drug policy that you, you impose. Well, well, no, because only, it's only the police that can actually legally stop somebody and make them take a, a breathalyser. So in work, if your drug and alcohol policy is random testing, and then alongside that is a disciplinary procedure, and then somebody refuses to take a random test, then you go down the disciplinary route. Um, where I work, if somebody refuses, although it's testing for cause, if somebody refuses that, they are automatically suspended. So it's taken as a positive test. Now suppose he suspects somebody just an accident at work, he suspects somebody is drug or alcohol related, get them tested, mm -hmm. it's brief, uh, mm -hmm. you don't find that as being legal. Mm -hmm. So would, well, I think, I think if, if companies set out their stall in terms of this is our policy, this is what you're signing up to in terms of your contract, and they know that that's, what they're, that's the environment they're going to be working in, 
then that's 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 the. I mean, obviously they could go for victimisation, couldn't they? I think I think actually it's more open with the um, suspicion of somebody's behaviour. So if somebody's behaving in an erratic manner, or they get aggressive, or they seem like they're out of character, then I think that is more open to actually the malicious accusations, and I'm being victimised. And obviously they can try and take the company to court, can't they? But whether or not they'd be successful. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be difficult for... Yeah, I think it would be difficult for somebody to, to go down that route if they'd had an accident or a near miss or they were driving. Hiya. Hiya. Yeah. I worked uh, with part of the rail industry at the point. Mm -hmm. And because the railway has a zero yes, policy, yeah. which you should ask staff on the railway, yeah. you have to have the same rules as well. So I don't know whether it's any yeah. other industry yeah. that has a zero policy like fire Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, I know that obviously, you know, clearly, you know, railways, yeah. you know, airline, zero tolerance is a must, isn't it, really? Just another one. What, what sort of area do you cover? Uh, are there other organisations, you know, we're, we're from all over the country, what, what area do you cover? Well, I cover um, Birmingham, Solihull, Whitley, Gaydon, Halewood and Wolverhampton. Halewood's in Liverpool, so. Some, um, just, just making a point actually, that when I, people ask me what my job is, and I say, oh, is there a problem then? at that organisation. And I say, well, actually, no more than anywhere else. Actually, this problem is everywhere, in every organisation, whether it's a car company, quarrying, an airport, a hospital. It's, it's everywhere. So I think they've actually been really, really forward-thinking in actually being proactive and getting somebody in, involved. Is that it? I've left um, some literature over on the desk, so please take, there's information about alcohol, um, there's um, an audit screening tool if you want to screen yourself in terms of drinking, um, and also I've done some, um, on, on that hand sheet, on that worksheet is about elimination rates, so you can work out units, elimination rates, so kind of in terms of, I'm very much about preventative drink drive because I ran drink drive courses for many years, so please take some literature and have a go because a lot of this is about raising awareness and the unit system being very complicated and people not understanding it. So, um, you know, hopefully take some information away for yourselves as well. Thank you. <laughs>